morning, everybody. Quick reminder, this is recorded. Hopefully, everybody's okay with that. All right, today we have the great pleasure to have Yun Chen with us today. He uh, is a PhD student at Harvard University um, and also visiting at uh, New York Tech, Cornell Tech. Um, he's uh, working with uh, Sasha Rush. That's why he's right now officially visiting at, at Cornell, Cornell Tech. Today, he's gonna tell us about uh, structural model modeling in language models. Uh, and Yun Tian is going to be joining the faculty at the University of Waterloo in um, July 2024. 20, uh, and he's looking for a one year, uh, uh, you know, postdoc position. Um, well, I'm great to have you here and uh, take it away. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for inviting me here and thank you for being here on a Monday morning. Um, so today I will be sharing my work on structural modeling in language models. So I'm pretty sure everybody has seen the impressive progress of tech generation these days. You have seen tech generation technologies used to falsify celebrities. We have seen them being used to write English essays that can pass AP English exams and be used to even pass bar exams. And there's even a scientific paper where ChatGPT, a chatbot is even listed as one of the co-authors. So um, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen how amazing high generation technology is today, but I still want to share this example. Um, so this is a pretty absurd question uh, that I asked ChatGPT with bananas, please add medicine. Um, so we cannot find the answer to this question on the internet, but when we ask ChatGPT this question, it gives us this response. Banana splits are not considered a medicine they are typically considered a dessert or a treat. However, bananas do contain some nutrients that can be beneficial for overall health, such as potassium, vitamin B6, and vitamin C. But consuming banana splits as medicine is not advisable. So I think this is pretty amazing because even for such an absurd question, our language model today can give us a pretty good reasonable response. And this is something that I couldn't have imagined when I just started my PhD research. You might wonder what's behind um, these text generation technologies. So the most important assumption made in text generation is to break down the problem of generating a sequence of words into the sub-problems of generating each word conditioned on our previous words. This is similar to building a building by putting down one brick at a time. You put down the first brick and then condition down where the first brick is, you put down the second brick and condition down where the first two bricks are, you put down the third brick. We repeat this process until we have a finished building. This is how we generate from a language model, but how do we achieve or how do we get this language model in the first place? We train the language model on the supervised task of next word prediction, following how we break down the problem into these sub-problems. We are given a prefix such as the student saw a blank. We train the language model to maximize the probability of observing the ground truth next word, in this case, cat. So this simple training and generation uh, techniques have resulted in the amazing language models we have. And they have been so successful these days that people have been even uh, thinking of extending them to applications beyond chatbot, such as using them to write long stories or even entire books, or even using them to replace software engineers like us uh, by using them to write code. But what's preventing us from getting there? Why aren't we replaced yet? So in order for these tech generation technologies uh, to uh, empower these uh, amazing applications I showed on the last slide, the generations from these language models need to be good at two different levels. At a surface level, we need to make sure that the genetic sentences are locally fluent, meaning that upon reading them, we humans can understand the meaning of each sentence. However, as we zoom out and look at the overall structure of the generation, we also need to make sure that the generation is structurally coherent. But in today's language model, even though when we look at the individual sentences, they are extremely fluent, when we zoom out and look at the overall structure, they are not that good. As an example, let me show you a 
structural coherence issue in the genetic text, again, uh, with ChatGPT. Let's ask this question. It's time to do the laundry. You need a white T-shirt, a blue pinstripe button down, a black turtleneck, and a red sweater with white polka dots. How many of those will need to do? So if we ask a future search engine this question, we hope that the answer it gives us is both locally fluent and also structurally coherent. But this is the response given by ChatGPT. And because it is pretty long, let's just focus on a snippet of this response. I will read this snippet, and, and as I'm reading it, I hope you to keep in mind two questions. First, does this generation look good at the surface level? And second, if we zoom out and look at the overall structure, is it structurally sound? Light colored clothing, such as the blue pinstripe button down, should be washed separately from dark colored clothing, such as the black curtain neck, to prevent dye from bleaching. You will likely need to do at least two loads of laundry, one for the white t-shirt and another for the blue pinstripe button down, black turtleneck, and red sweater with white polar dots. I think most people will agree with me that this generation looks extremely good at the surface level. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, when I just started my PhD, I couldn't have imagined that by the time I graduate, um, we would have this level of tech generation technology. However, there's a structural issue in this generation. If you read the first paragraph, it said that the blue button down should be washed separately from the black turtleneck. But in the next paragraph, it said that we can use a single load for the blue button down and the black turtleneck, creating a self-contradiction. This is an example of language model generations being extremely good at the surface level. But when we zoom out and look at the overall structure, there are many issues. So my research focuses on studying these structural modeling issues in language models. My research can be broadly categorized into two directions. The first direction of my work aims to extract and evaluate structures in language models, ranging from trying to identify structural issues in the genetic text to trying to understand the rationale for making each individual word prediction. My second line of research aims to improve structural modeling ranging from trying to bring in a global model to improve structural modeling to trying to use a hierarchical formulation to make the generation structurally better. In today's talk, I will introduce um, each uh, of my representative work from each category, and I will start from evaluate structural modeling in language models. Throughout this part of the talk, I will be using this running example. This is a generation from a GPT-2 large model, and this is pretty representative of text generated by language models today. So this is a meta story about a movie, and if you read it, you can see that it's uh, pretty fluent uh, if you re read each sentence, but there are many structural issues as I will show later in the talk. So there has been a lot of research on how to quantify the surface level fluency of language model generations. But quantifying the structural coherence issues of model generations is an underexplored area. Most research in tech generation is usually evaluated in some kind of um, evaluation metric for local coherence, for local fluency, such as ungram matching, like blue score, mean score. But, um, there are not many works on how to evaluate the structural coherence of tech generation, mainly because first, it is pretty hard to define the notion of structural coherence. And second, as I have shown earlier in the introduction uh, example, sometimes it's even pretty hard for a human annotator to identify those structural issues. So our work is actually inspired um, by MOV, um, which um, proposed to evaluate open-ended tech generation by inducing and comparing the distributions. In particular, MOV evaluates open-ended tech generation by comparing the distribution of um, the embeddings induced under a large pre-trained language model between model generations and human-written text. And if there is any mismatch, 
then that indicates some generation issues. And our approach um, induces the distributions at a structural level. It consists of three steps. In the first step, we assume that we have access to a critic that can extract structure, structural features from text. So we first take a sample from the language model, and then we apply this critic to extract some structural features. Here, I'm talking about structural features in a pretty abstract sense. So I'm representing them as these connected boxes. But later on, I will show concrete examples of what I mean by structural features. And in the next step, we learn distributions over these extracted structural features. We learn two different distributions. We learn one distribution over the induced structural features from model generations, and we learn another distribution over structural features from human written text. So by the end of this step, you would have two potentially different distributions, one for the model generations, another for the real data. In the third step, we would compare these two distributions and check for any mismatches. So if the two distributions match, then that means that the model is capturing the structural features pretty well. But on the other hand, if we see any mismatch between these two distributions, then we have identified some issues of the model to capture those structural features. As I'll show later using examples, there are actually many different notions of structural features. And for that purpose, for each notion of structural feature, we need to use a different critic. And for each different critic, we need to repeat the previous three steps. So the framework that I'm talking about is um, called model prism or model checking in the Bayesian literature, um, which is a decades old technique. But here we are applying this technique to analyzing modern language models. Okay, so now that I have talked about this method uh, in the abstract sense, let's look at some real examples of how it works. As a reminder, I will be using this running example article to analyze different notions of structural features. In particular, I will analyze two different notions of structural features using two different critics, and I will show issues, structural issues of this running example. The first structural feature we look at is section structures. So we first took this, we first take this um, language model generation, and next we apply a critic to extract structural features. And in this particular example, the critic is a section classifier, and the extracted structural features are where each section begins and ends, as well as the topic of each section. So for this particular example, the extracted structural features are the first section is an abstract section. The second section is a plot section. The third section is again a movie plot section. And the last section is a reception section. So in the third step, we would compare these extracted structural features to the distribution of structural features in human written text. And we can see that this transition from a plot section to another plot section is distributionally unlikely under the diffusion of human written structures. And this is pretty intuitive because what's happening in this article is that after finishing talking about a movie plot in the second section, in the third section, this article begins talking about a new movie plot. And the human writer would never write an article in this way. And the human reader would be pretty confused if they read an article about a movie but with two different movie plots. Our method allows the automatic identification of such a structural issue. The second example we look at is pronouns. We again take this running example and we focus on a snippet from this running example. A girl, Rosane, and her friend, Lisa, have an argument at the local coffee shop. The two women eventually get a chance encounter with a guy, Josh. They tell him she has a boyfriend. So after extracting this sneaky from the article, we again apply a critic to extract the structural features. And in this particular case, the critic is a co-reference resolution system. And the extracted structural features are the anti-dimensions in the snippet. And in the last step, 
we compare the extracted structural features to the distribution of structural features in human written text. And you can see that this last pronoun, she, is distributionally unlikely. And again, this is pretty intuitive because what's happening in this article is that the language model is trying to use the pronoun she to refer to a female entity mentioned two sentences ago. And in that sentence, there are actually two different female entities this pronoun she could possibly refer to. Again, a human writer wouldn't write an article in this way, and a human reader would be pretty confused upon reading this. Actually, if I was to write this article, I would probably use the name of the person that um, I actually want to refer to here. But the language model is using this pronoun she, even though there's full ambiguity. Our method, again, allows the automatic identification of such a structural issue. Um, so I have, I have shown you uh, some uh, individual examples of structural features. You might wonder how good language models perform overall. So we begin by setting up the baseline performance of different language models in terms of surface level modeling. And here, due to the expertise of the audience, the service card we use is actually perplexity. So the lower, the better. And on the axis, I will be showing language models of different sizes. They're actually all GP2 series. So the largest uh, model is GP2 XL, which has around 1.4 billion parameters. So not surprisingly, we can see that as we improve the size of the language model, the propacity is getting lower and lower, meaning that we get better and better surface level modeling. And this is not surprising because today is almost a common wisdom in the machine learning community that the better the model, the, la the larger the model, the better it is. But what about the story in terms of structure modeling? So we look at the section structure scores of different models. And to begin with, we start looking at the structure score of GPT-2 small, which is shown in this purple bar. And as a comparison, we show the structure score of human written text by sim simply applying this metric to text samples from human data, uh, which is shown in the dashed line here. And immediately we can see a mismatch here showing that there is a distribution mismatch between the diffusion of structural features in model generations and the distribution of structural features in human recent text. But you might wonder whether increasing the size of the model will fix this issue. And um, unfortunately, as we increase the size of the language model, it doesn't seem that this gap is going away. Um, although I want to mention the caveat that the large model we tested is GT2XL, so it's actually pretty small by today's standard, and uh, we don't have empirical evidence of how big models will behave um, when we uh, measure the structural scores. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the structural score is calculated as like some like distribution difference relative to human generated text. Oh, the structural score is actually, yeah, that's a very good question. I think I, I'm getting where you are trying to get at. So the structural score is actually the cross entropy between the two distributions. That's the reason why even human written text doesn't get a structural score of zero. But it's computed relative to human text. Sure. Yes, it is computed relative to human text. So why isn't the cross entropy? Oh, because the cross entropy between two identical oh, distributions would okay. be the entropy of that distribution. So it's still not zero. That's really why we need to use it as a baseline. We can definitely, have, for example, we can subtract it um, from the um, other scores. Mm -hmm. They would have like a zero center thing. But it's just a presentation you should come. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and lastly, uh, we have been talking about these structural scores as if they are some kind of metric for structural coherence of the type. But you might wonder whether this correlates with the human notion of structural coherence. And to get some peace of mind, we do a um, correlation study between the structural score uh, we calculated and the human judgment of structural coherence. And here on the x-axis, I will be showing the human score, the human judgment of structural coherence of different systems. And on the y-axis, I will be showing different um, evaluation metrics uh, computed at, at different systems. And we will begin by looking at the correlation between surface score, which is perplexity, and human score. And we can see that there's not a perfect correlation here showing that word level or 
surface level score does not correlate with the human judgment of structural coherence. And as we use the structural score computed uh, using model criticism, we can see that the correlation is much stronger. So I have shown the quantity results, but you might still wonder what exact kind of errors the model generations make compared to human written text. And here I will be visualizing the section transition differences between human written text and model generations. I will begin by uh, introducing the notations. So here I will be using the node uh, to represent a section topic and each edge to represent a section transition. The number labeled on each edge is the difference between the section transition probability measured on real data, sorry, measured on model generations and the section transition probability model on human written text. And optionally, we might use reg to highlight a transition that we never observe in human written text. For example, this red arrow is highlighting the fact that this transition from a background section into a word section was never observed in our training day. So this is the overall section transition differences between model generations and human written text, where the width of each line is proportional to the absolute differences in the scores. And let's look at individual section transition errors that this model usually makes. So the most common type of section transition error is to repeat a section as shown by these um, self loops. Those are the repeat, those, those are not um, observed in data and an example which has been shown in the running example uh, from the movie plot into another movie plot. Another type of section transition error is to end the article too early as shown by this transition where it directly transitions into an end of sequence symbol right after the background section. And this is pretty weird because a human writer wouldn't uh, just an article abruptly upon just right finishing writing the background section. But there are also other types of section transition mistakes as well, um, which are simply section transitions we do not observe in the data, but we do observe in the model generations. So they seem to indicate to me that the model is not having a high level plan when it is trying to generate an article. Um, and our method allows the automatic identification and quantification of these structural issues. So to recap, um, in this part of the talk, we introduce a method for evaluating structural coherence by extracting and comparing the diffusion of structures on model generations and human written text. We show that mod language models uh, that we tested have trouble at modeling structures. And I think most interestingly um, to me, better surface level modeling does not automatically translate into better structure modeling. Um, any questions so far? I think a very natural question is, how do you use the model critic to improve the generation? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think that's actually related to the second part of the talk, although um, I, I want to um, mention that uh, the second par part of the talk uh, is actually not doing exactly that, um, but it is a pretty relevant idea. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yes, they are um, average over many samples. Like fully stochastic samples. Right, right. Guess, okay. Yes. Because we are trying to check for distributional mismatches. If we do something like truncated sampling, it would affect the statistics naturally. Okay. Um, so now that we have seen there are structural modeling issues in language models, the next question is, how do we improve um, structural modeling of language models? So in the previous part of the talk, as through the introductory examples, we have seen that language models are doing pretty well at surface level modeling. So the generated sentences are pretty readable to a human reader. Um, however, as we zoom out and look at structures, there are many issues. For this part of the talk, I will abuse notation a little bit, and I will rename the language models we have been talking about so far as a local model and the reason I'm renaming it as a local model is because if you look at the probability 
assigned by this model to a sequence of tags x1 through xn, we can factorize that as the product of the probabilities of each word conditioned on previous words. And in the previous parts of the talk, we have seen that this local model is really good at surface level modeling. So the core idea of this part of the talk is to introduce a global model in charge of structure modeling, in particular in a hypothetical um, scenario, if we have a global model that can assign a higher structure score for structurally sound generation compared to um, a structurally poor generation, then we can potentially incorporate this global model to improve our local model. So our joint model is a combination of the local model and the, the global model, where we simply multiply these two models together. And this joint model is strictly speaking more powerful than the local model itself, because in the worst case, we can set, simply set the global model to be one and we recover the performance of the local model. So this global model is acting as a residual or trying to fix the issues uh, that we have seen in the local model. So this formalism seems pretty natural, but uh, what's preventing people from using it um, in the past? There are two challenges um, associated with this formalism. The first challenge is how do we train this model? So in the previous um, slides, we have shown that to train the local model, we can simply train the model on the supervised task of next word prediction. For example, given this prefix, the students saw a blank, we can use the local model to produce a score over the, each of the word in the vocabulary, and then we can normalize the scores to get a probability. And then we can apply maximum likelihood estimation to train the model. But once we introduce the global model into the picture, we need to not, we cannot normalize over the possible words in the vocabulary. Instead, we need to normalize over the possible sequences to get a valid probability distribution. And the size of the space of the possible sequences grows exponentially with the length of the sequence. So doing this is computationally infeasible and we cannot directly apply maximum likelihood estimation to this um, model. So the key inside of this work is our goal is to have the joint model which is a product of the local model and the global model to be equal to the distribution of cumulative types. And we can do simple arithmetic by dividing both sides of the equation by the local model. So we can see that our goal is to have the global model to be equal to the density ratio between cumulative types and the local model. So we have converted our training problem into a density ratio estimation problem. Although this problem is still pretty challenging because even though we can easily sample from the human written text distribution, we cannot evaluate the probability of some text under the human distribution. So another trick we use is to simply apply Bayesian theorism and convert the density ratio into this probability of some text being from a human author over the probability of this same text coming from a local model. And these two probabilities can be easily estimated by training a classifier to distinguish human written text and local model generations. After training this binary classifier, we can simply take outputs from this binary classifier as the estimates for some text coming from, the probability of some text coming from a human author or the probability of the text coming from a local model. So to put everything together, we first construct a data set of local model samples and human text, and then we train a classifier. And based on this classifier, we can apply Bayes theorem and estimate the density ratio. And the joint model is simply the product between the local model and this global model, which is the density ratio. So to get more intuition, let's consider a 1D toy example where we assume that the text we have uh, falls on this um, on a one dimensional line and we are showing the density function of human written text on the left hand side of the plot and the density function of the local model generation under the right hand side of the plot. 
And we can see that these two distributions mainly differ in the highlighted region. So if we train a classifier to distinguish human text from local model generations, it will assign a low score to anything in this highlighted region. Because in this highlighted region, there's just a higher density under the local model distribution compared to the human distribution. So when we multiply this density ratio estimation with the local model, we can see that it has the effect of adjusting the density function of the local model to penalize anything in this highlighted region to bring the scores lower to address it to match the human written distribution. So now that we have solved the training issue, the second challenge is how to generate from this model. So again, in the previous local model case, it's pretty easy. We can just sample left to right, one word at a time. We first sample the first word and then condition where the first word is. We sample the second word and we repeat this until we have a complete um, article. But for the Joint model, after we introduce this global model, we can no longer break down the probability of the text over the probability of each individual word condition on previous words. And instead, we propose a two-tier sampling approach where we first sample a set of candidates from the local model. And this is, can be done pretty efficiently because sampling from the local model can be done by just sampling one word at a time. In the second step, we score and all the candidates in this candidate set using the global model. So by the end of this second step, we would have a set of candidates and their scores under the global model. In the third step, we resample from the candidate set using the global scores. So actually, this generation procedure is pretty similar to the sample and the re-rank um, framework um, taken by um, many previous works where we first sample a bunch of candidates and then we use a re-ranker to re-rank. Although here we are using the re-ranker to resample. Okay, so we have finished talking about the approach. Now that um, let's, let's look at how good this approach is. We um, use a data set um, of CC News consisting about 22 billion tokens. And for the local model, we use a unidirectional transformer for the global model, because of the fact that it can um, get access to the entire sequence at once, we can personally use a bidirectional transformer and we can leverage the pre-trained bidirectional transformers such as BERT or Roberta. And uh, we train this model using say four GPUs for uh, roughly 10 hours. So let's first look at how good the models perform at a surface level. First, we look at a baseline performance established by evaluating the local model itself in terms of perplexity. And next, as we introduce the global model, we can see that we get a slightly better perplexity. And if you use a pre-trained global model, we can get an even better um, surface score. But what we are most interested in is the structural coherence of the generations. For that, we perform a human evaluation where we compare generations from different systems and ask human annotators to say which generation is better. And as a baseline, we compare generations from the local model to generations of um, humans or human written text. And we can see that human written text is preferred around 69% of the time. But once we introduce the global model and compare generations from the joint model to, mod to human written text, we can see that the new generations are much harder to discriminate, uh, to be discriminated by the human annotators. And when we compare generations from the local model to the generations from the joint model, not surprisingly, we can see that generations from the joint model are preferred more often. This is a binary setting, right? You yeah, binary setting. Them to yeah, yeah, yes. Um, and after we have seen the quantitative results, let's take a qualitative look at what the global model is doing to better understand the model behavior. For this experiment, I will be conditioning the generation to this common prefix. Amanda said, I'm going to start acting again. I want to do TV, maybe a few guest spots. I'm not going to, going to do a blank. I will 
use the local model to generate completions of this prefix. And then I will use the global model to score the complete sequences. So the first generation from the local model is, I'm not going to do a television show. So we can see that this creates a self-contradiction, similar to the laundry example we have seen earlier. That earlier on, Amanda said that she wants to do TV, but then she said that I'm not going to do a television show. And you can see that the global model is able to assign that a low score. The second completion um, doesn't create a contradiction, but is create kind of a repetition, um, which is pretty characteristic of a language model generation. So the second completion reads maybe a few gas spots. I'm not going to do a soap, but maybe a gas spot. And again, we can see that the global model is able to assign a low score to this sequence. And when we look at completions without obvious um, issues, we can see that in general, the global model is able to assign higher scores um, to those generations. So this basically tells us some insight about how the model works because there are certain characteristics of generations from the local model that can, that can be picked up by the global model the global model will be able to penalize those uh, issues and address the probabilities of those sequences to make them lower, thereby alleviating the structural coherence issues from the local model. Um, okay, so to recap, um, in this part of the talk, I introduced a global model into the local model to improve structural modeling. And we have shown that the training of this model can be reduced to sensitive visual estimation, which can be further reduced into training a binary classifier. And you, experiments show that generations from the system get better surface scores, and also the generations are considered more coherent by human judges. Um, and actually, I realized that um, this work is relevant um, to the iterative self-distillation or self-imitation learning in the sense that the generations might be further used to fine-tune the local model to further improve it, and we can probably repeat this procedure iteratively. Um, regarding the global model performance, don't you think that if your local model is not good enough to give you good samples to begin with, it will still be upper bounded by the performance of the local model? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it is indeed the case with the current decoding algorithm. But I say I think modeling is a separate issue from decoding. So the two-tier sampling approach is building the final sample by first sampling a set of candidates from the local model and then resampling from this candidate set. So imagine if we have a noise distribution as the local model, then there's basically no chance of getting anything reasonable to begin with. So no matter how good, we, how hard we try to rerun, uh, we wouldn't end up with anything reasonable. Um, but I say, um, first, theoretically, if you can sample infinite number of sequences, there will still be some good sequences, even using the noise distribution. And second, that's why I mentioned, I think generation is a separate issue from modeling. This is only one way of generating from the model. Actually, there was a follow-up work um, of our work um, by a university in, in France, which used um, measure policy testing to more efficiently sample from the joint model, which can, I think, allevi alleviate this issue by kind of also sampling in this autoregressive way and estimating the future rewards by kind of rolling out the Monte Carlo tree. Yeah, but I think that's a really good point. And, and also, by the way, the experiments we run are pretty expensive in the sense that we actually took 10,000 samples for per sentence and then we rank them to kind of get the best kind of boost in um, performance. So I think it's indeed a really good point um, that this is upper bounded by what's available in the candidate set. Yeah, um, any other questions? <clears throat> Have you thought about an um, alternative approach? Like, just thinking about how human generate sentences. Sometimes we uh, say something and then we realize that's not quite clear. And then you kind of improve 
on your on pre uh, previous sentiment. Like you mean something like a self correction yeah, or uh, like like diffusion kind of or iterative refinement kind of. Yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, I think that's a pretty promising direction. Um, we can probably like uh, put a discussion offline. I actually uh, like I have a lab mate who's working on something along that line of research right now. Um, and I, I do agree that's a kind of a very promising way of generating text. Um, yeah, if uh, there's no other questions, I can talk about my my future plans. Um, so my research has been doing um, like structure extraction, structure evaluation from these language models. And in the short term, I'm interested in how to extract semantic parses from language models. For example, this uh, dependency trace as shown in this um, slide, I think this might be useful for, um, for example, better understand um, the language. To me, language models serve as an interface between humans and machines. And I feel that being able to convert the unstructured text into some structured knowledge representations would enable us to build better systems because for machines, they can work really um, naturally with the structured representation compared with unstructured text. And maybe language model can just serve as the interface to do the first phase of translation. And then we can just um, build our system in the structured space. For example, this example, I, I just try to show that um, the morality of uh, action depends on the context and by having a structured representation, we can um, more easily classify which is okay, which is not okay. So the goal of my uh, short-term research is to um, develop or find a way to express structural representation of text in broad domains. Um, and hopefully I can, um, kind of by the end of the year, uh, I mean, but in, in, in a year's time, I can get an efficient semantic parser and also a data, data side as a byproduct. And I hope that the structured text representations can be applied to downstream applications, such as common sense morality or even summarization. Because if you have a structured graph, not like semantic graph representation, maybe it's easier to summarize even from multiple documents or it can interact with external APIs such as um, booking on your calendar or trying to query a database to answer certain questions. And the research questions that I try to answer are, first, how do we represent um, the many parses? How do we um, linearize them such that they can be outputted by the language models? Because language models are not trained on a lot of data containing this um, grammar trees. I think this is um, probably the first question I know that I need to answer. And I was thinking of like something like along the line of our uh, in-between dependency tree and AMR. The second question is how do we make sure that the output parses are valid? For example, for MR parsing, if we output a sequence of sheep reduced actions, we need to make sure that it is applicable. And for that, I think constraint decoding such as neural logic would be pretty relevant. And third, what if language models are bad? I think this is actually pretty likely given that language models are not um, pre-trained on a lot of uh, data containing grammar trees. And also I'm trying to um, use smaller language models that for which we have ways, uh, accessible weights. And for this, I think the kind of critic self imitation learning self dissertation uh, would be useful definitely and also i want to explore using prompting or trying to derive a consensus solution from different language models um, if um, we still cannot get good enough performance from the previous techniques um, yeah with that i i want to end my talk and i'm happy to take any questions And we have plenty of time for questions. Sure. So I love the uh, idea of considering structures explicitly. Um, yeah, I think uh, towards the end of uh, your talk, you're talking about 
future directions and how maybe these large language models are not necessarily trained on explicit structured representations. Um, but I'm a little bit uh, addicted to Twitter. And as I'm scrolling on Twitter, I saw a screenshot of GPT-4 outputting an example from the Connell 2003 like, tree bank. Um, yeah, I'm curious if you have, uh, I guess, thoughts or fears about data contamination. If you're trying oh, that's to a really good question. I, I, I do feel that that's like a serious issue. For example, I, I think like GPT-4 or even kind of the future iterations, they are really likely to be trained on data sets such as uh, GFM 8K or other like, I mean, Pantry Bank definitely and Kono. So I think that's a, indeed a really serious issue. Um, and that makes evaluation harder. Um, but I think for my research, I try to um, find a supervised way to extract the knowledge about um, um, kind of being able to kind of hard sentences. And, and if the knowledge is um, kind of already contained in a language model, no matter like how they acquire the knowledge, I think that's probably not a kind of big concern for me. If, if for example, um, but, I, but I, I can imagine it might make kind of evaluation harder. We need to make sure that we evaluate on kind of cases that are not existing in current data sets. Yeji yeah. has a question. Yeah. Hey, great talk. Um, can we go back to the killing a bear slide? Uh, there, the semantic parser is identical between the second and third example and the killing a bear portion will look identical across all of these cases. So uh, maybe can you comment a little bit more on uh, how uh, this type of structure uh, can be used to, to distinguish the differences between these samples? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the difference is in the context part. And I would imagine in this case, the lexical, uh, the lexicon would be important, for example, Killing to save and killing to please would be different if you look at kind of the actual word corresponding to the note. Um, and I was thinking, I, 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 I'm not sure if this is doable, but I was thinking of, of something like build, building a prescriptic uh, morality machine that can kind of operate on this graph. And it can, for example, assign a score of something like killing to save, maybe it's more desirable compared to killing to please. And uh, yeah, basically the short answer is, I think we need to look at the, 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 the lexicon. Um, I think uh, in this particular parse, uh, labeling um, um, schema, I don't think it actually provides the important information that's missing here, which is the missing arguments. Like humans immediately resolve what the missing arguments are for saving and policing, for uh, as well as killing a bear. Uh, and I, actually, um, the I, argument is the same for these cases. Um, I was thinking the other case in which killing a bear, uh, if it is to uh, for. Um, if it's trying to kill your child versus if it's trying to, no, sorry, if it's going to save your child. Uh, in that case, uh, yeah, there's difference for pronoun resolution, I guess. Um, yeah, so for for this case, I agree with you that the, the only resolution seems to be um, uh, sort of a little bit outside the parse labels and uh, figuring out how exactly that should be done seems to be the open research question. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah I definitely agree with that, yeah. Um, and then I had a different question. Um, so I really like the, your, your models that tries to learn global structure um, in general. I wonder whether you had a um, chance to look at GPT-4 output. Um, oh, not, not, not here at Fiasaika. Practically, I, I was on the job market then, so I haven't been doing research for a year. Yeah, or, or do you have a hunch about what it's going to look like? I, I mean, it may seem good. Yeah, I think 
Oh, oh, by the way, one thing, one thing I noticed from playing with these language models is I feel if something is explicit, then it's doing really good. For example, imagine if you generate an article consisting of where each paragraph starts with first, second, third, and last in summary. I think when there's an explicit clue, it's doing really well. But when the information needs to be synthesized, I feel it's doing really terrible. And again, this insight comes from kind of and my faculty applications, I try to use GPT-4 to help writing statements. Uh -huh. And I feel that it's really bad at writing statements. I just didn't get much help from it. For example, I want to separate out my research statement into my past research and future research. Even something that simple is very really hard to do. And also I found that, for example, you want to say, I mean, this is probably well known that it's hard to control the output length. So that I want to say, I want like, a 400 word summary of my research i just cannot do that um yeah so in terms of the question i i think when my intuition is when it's explicit when, when there are explicit markers in the generation it's modeling the explicit markers very well but when there there aren't these explicit markers when the information needs to be synthesized somehow it's doing not that well in terms of structural modeling and i think that's also found by for example kevin young's Kind of work on story generation where he found that for example if you first state the kind of the characters their characteristics their kind of motivations things like that the general stories are more coherent than directly uh, sampling from oh but i think he was doing gpt3 i'm not sure about gpt4 though i um really appreciate you showing a failure case of gpt4 when everyone else says that everything works so <laughs> I, I'm exaggerating. We, we, uh, us mosaic tends to write papers that complains when GPT-4 fails, but it's just generally hard to convince the community that GPT-4 can fail. So, um, very nice. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I may have one more question. Sorry. Um, the your earlier question about you know consistencies, lack of consistencies. I presume that detecting that kind of incon logic inconsistencies is still harder through your models. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's a, actually a very good point. So actually in my actual, um, I, I was using that as a motivating example, but in my actual experiments, for example, I'm focusing on section structures, which is probably different from logical consistency. Yeah. I feel that being able to analyze logical consistency issues rely on having access to a really good kind of logic parser or something like that. Yeah. OK, thank you. Great talk. Um, and yeah, very great talk. Thank you so much. So I have a quick question. Like in the second part of the talk, where, where you talk about this global model that take, takes care of the structural, uh, structural representation. Um, so I have two questions. One is how does it like these uh, then uh, density estimate uh, amounts to structural representation? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes, I, I think I think it probably isn't. That really depends on what the residual is. So I'm calling it structures because um, if we assume that the local model is really doing great at um, surface level modeling, then what's left, the left signal that can be used to identify whether it's a model generation versus human written text is probably structural. So I'm naming it in this sense. But for example, if the local model is terrible, um, is not kind of achieving a world level fluency, um, then maybe the global model is uh, building on top of the kind of the, the local word use issues. But but when I actually look at the generations, I, I feel that is more kind of capitalizing on the structural issues such as a repeat rep, a repetitive structure, a repeating section, things like that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So then following uh, following on that, I wonder if you had the chance to look at uh, like the generations coming from the joint model um, and compare it using your model criticism and see like um, mm. yeah that's a really good question I I, I haven't but I but I, I think that's that's a really good point um, of um, for example evaluating the generation um, using model criticism yeah I think that's a really good point whether, like, yeah. there is uh, improvements uh, in certain aspects yeah yeah yeah. Model, in certain aspects. yeah 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 Thank you.
So I'm wondering how dependent this is on having some sense of a priori, like this is the structure that we want to impose, like section mm. um, sequences and then like, for example, logic and stuff. So it seems like ahead of time, you're like, this is the structure that we notice is broken and this is the classifier we're going to train global classifier. So I, I'm just curious what you Yeah, I, I actually, I also, I also been thinking about it. It, 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 it is indeed reliant on kind of um, predefined structural notions. But also um, on, on another side, I was also thinking to, I, I mean, for a statistical model, um, for it to span capacity and modeling some data, how do you tell kind of the different number of bits kind of differently? For example, we humans know that these high level notions matter more than the low level issues. Um, but for statistical model without giving it the inductive biases, maybe it's very hard for it to know that uh, where it should spend its capacity on. It's like, it reminds me of, uh, Harriet House argument on the difference between a great mathematician and a mathematics student is that, that a great mathematician kind of because they are kind of far apart kind of from doing the low level proofs. If you look at their proofs, there are like some typos and mistakes, but they are easily fixable because the high level intuition is, is usually right. But for a mathemat mathematics student, they rely on kind of, they are, they are really good at writing these kind of rigorous proof chains but sometimes like a single mistake in the proof chain will invalidate the entire proof. So it's a dif difference between a mistake at a low level versus a mistake at a high level. And it, it feels to me that language model is kind of having similar behaviors. If I look at GP4 generations, for example, I feel that it's making way fewer grammatical errors compared to me, but I feel that I'm probably doing a better job at, I mean, at least in writing my own research statement, I'm doing a better job at kind of the high level kind of dynamics. Um, I think you talk about a lot like the structural features um, in the first part of your work, like the uh, section, and also talk about a lot of like fine grain um, structural representation, like AMR. I was wondering whether you thought about like, something like in the middle um, to better represent like the structural in the long document, say it will be very hard to extract like a symmetric like, AMR part mm -hmm. from a long document. But personally, I feel like the section identifier seems to be a little bit more abstract, so that's something like I can Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't thought about that before, but I think it's indeed kind of worth thinking about. So it's like, yeah, I can imagine maybe something like a hierarchical way of representing structures would be nice. Um, but uh, but for, for now, at least in the short future, I'm just thinking of like a, a few sentences, something of at that level. I think it's uh, 11 on the dot. Yes, thank you, everyone.